Okay, welcome back. So now let's keep talking about asset allocation, related decisions in portfolio management, now talking about the real world constraints. Okay, so let's start with talking about asset size. So let's say we start with a small portfolio. We've got a small client, individual, institutional, doesn't matter, but if it's a small portfolio, then what that means is that first of all, that client may lack the expertise to be able to understand and be comfortable with a complex strategy. It may also mean the dollar amount of the portfolio is too small to be able to handle that type of strategy. I said dollar, euro, whatever currency we want to put this in, but it's just simply too small to think about investing in things like hedge funds, private equity, venture capital. We may need to keep it pretty simple. Um, legislation, other regulations may also limit asset or access. So defining qualified investors based upon the size of investor assets and experience, if we're looking at limited partnerships, for example, again, these things have kind of a minimum investment. It just simply may not be uh, feasible for somebody that has a small portfolio. Small investors, they may be able to use commingled accounts to be able to gain access if there are some private equity investments that allow basically a conglomeration of small accounts to basically add up to sort of one big uh, investor. Well, you know, there are some private equity vehicles that do allow access and that sort of thing, but it's relatively a minority. So the smaller the account, well, typically those alternative type of investments are gonna be hard to reach. Now, if we have large portfolios, well, it doesn't necessarily mean that everything's easy. So they don't have the same limitations. They can also benefit from economies of scale, right, when investing allows us to achieve higher levels of diversification. So certainly it makes things easier, but it's not always perfect, right? Their size, if they get to be so big, well, that also means that we can exhaust the capacity of a trading strategy. So let's say we see an advantage in a particular niche of the market. So let's say we have some analysts that are really good at identifying opportunities in distressed debt, okay? Great, we can capture some alpha by exploiting those strategies. However, if our portfolio is huge, well, that means we may just simply be exhausting the capacity. There aren't enough distressed debt opportunities out there. We exhaust all of them. We still have a huge amount of our portfolio to invest. And so as a result that, yeah, maybe it adds a little bit of alpha to our portfolio, but it's probably not going to sort of, you know, totally change our client's perception of us, right? It's a little bit of an advantage, but, you know, it's not going to totally change the world. So as a result, we may uh, exhaust this capacity simply by virtue of the fact that we're too big. Now, another constraint, liquidity. So some assets provide insufficient liquidity. So if we look at alternative investments like hedge funds, private equity, things like that, it's hard to cash out of those. You can only do it in certain periods of time. And there may be a gate in terms of preventing you from taking out too much of your investment. It also may be the case where, you know, we just have some illiquid assets that don't trade very often. Certainly we can look at stocks and definitely a lot of bonds that are out there where if we invest in them today and we need to liquidate them tomorrow, well, we're going to take a hit because there's just simply not that many buyers in those types of security. So that insufficient liquidity is something that we're going to require a liquidity premium in order to be comfortable owning those investments in the portfolio. In other words, this needs to be a pretty good bargain for us for us to take on this liquidity risk. So liquidity needs are going to be affected by the total resources of the investor, including those outside the portfolio. If we have a large client that has a large portfolio, but they have access to cash from elsewhere, well, then maybe they don't have a very high need for liquidity. On the other hand, if we're looking at an individual portfolio, particularly an individual that may be you know, a little bit nervous and risk averse, also may have some certain emotional biases, well, if we have a market crash like we had in 2008, 2009, this is going to be something where particularly those small investors, those nervous investors are going to want to pull money out, get liquidity, get that stuff put into cash, and they may pressure you to liquidate significant amounts of the portfolio. Well, if you have... Um, heavily traded stocks, you know, stocks that are very liquid and easy to turn into cash, well, okay, you're going to take on some bid-ask spread loss, some commissions there, right? There's going to be some direct costs to that, eh, but not so bad. On the other hand, if you've invested them in alternatives, if you've invested them in thinly traded stocks, well, then there's going to be a, a much bigger hit. So this is just another example where you need to know your client and you need to educate that client as to what their true liquidity needs should be. So liquidity declines, investors, they tend to liquidate at the worst time, right? Just as the market's crashing or as the market's crashing, well, maybe there's a freeze in those markets, right? If you owned mortgage-backed securities in uh, the 2008 period and you said, boy, I really want to get my cash out of these, you go to sell them, there's no buyers. 
that market just completely froze up. Or if you were an investor in commercial paper, there was a very brief period of time where the market really panicked in commercial paper, where suddenly liquidity in that market just suddenly dried up to zero almost overnight. So in these panics, when some investors, nervous investors, are looking for liquidity uh, the most intense periods of time, they may find that it's not there. So again, this is going to be a matter of you educating your client, working with that client to say, okay, take a breath. We're going to ride this out, get to a point where liquidity has started to thaw out again. You start to have greater ability to trade and liquidate at that time if you still feel the need to do so. All right, another constraint, time horizon, right? Asset allocation, we need to make this an adjustable process, right? Because as time passes, the various aspects of that investor change. They reach a different stage of their life or the institution has a greater need for liquidity, lower need for liquidity. Things change over time. And again, as part of that process with your client, you're going to sort of keep checking in with them to get a sense of, is their situation changing and does that need to result in changes to the portfolio? So portfolio objectives and constraints can change over time. The allocation between human and financial capital shifts, particularly if we're talking about an individual, right? If you start a client at age 30 when they have a very large amount of human capital ahead of them, but maybe very little financial capital, that's going to be a very different scenario than if you still have that client when they're 55, starting to get close to retirement. The human capital has shrunk down. The financial capital, hopefully, under your guidance, has grown immensely. And so they're just simply in a different situation. The portfolio should reflect that. Longer time horizons typically allow for greater risk, right? We want to invest in equities when we have a good long time period to do so, unless we feel very, very confident that we have a positive alpha opportunity in front of us. But in general, if we're going to be uh, you know, a little bit more on the passive side and perhaps a bit more on the humble side, yeah, we want to say yes. These are long-term investments. That's how we're going to generate the greatest wealth. And the greatest probability of adding wealth is giving it the time to grow as it needs to. So time does diversify our risk in that sense, right? You're going to have ups and downs in the market, but the longer time horizon you have, the more that client is going to be able to ride those peaks and valleys out and hopefully under your tutelage, get a very solid rate of return. Okay, now let's move on to another constraint, one that for individuals, eh, maybe we don't have to give as much thought to, but certainly with institutions, regulatory restraints. All right, so mostly institutions here, as you can see on the left here. So if we're looking at an insurance company, okay, so they may have some risk-based capital requirements. You have insurance commissioners and they have insurance regulations, and so they're going to be checking that portfolio to make sure that that portfolio is invested in ways that meet the regulatory requirements of the day. And so it's not just, you know, they look at insurance companies when they're on the brink of becoming insolvent. No, if we have, you know, a good insurance board, good insurance commissioners, they're looking at this on a regular period of time. And so obviously as, your portf as their portfolio manager, you need to be cognizant of that and make sure that you're staying within those parameters. So there's a requirement to invest in assets with certain liquidity and credit rating, specific accounting and reporting requirements. You have to make sure that you meet all those demands under that umbrella. Pension funds, well, certainly you have to meet those pension obligations today. And if the pension fund is currently at a deficit, well, then you may have to come up with a plan to say, okay, here's how we're going to eradicate that deficit. Here's the glide path that we're going to put ourselves on to get to being fully funded. So you may have some restrictions to investing in certain asset classes. A pension fund is, you know, obviously going to have a very high fixed income component, again, because of that low risk and uh, um, need for regular cash flows. You may have some specific funding and reporting requirements there as well. Endowments and foundations, well, they do have some regulations, but it's a little bit more freewheeling, certainly relative to insurance companies and pension funds. They may have a minimum required annual distribution in order to keep their tax-exempt status, let's say. They may have to throw off a certain percentage of cash flow in order to sort of keep that, uh, that tax exemption. And so that maybe is one requirement. It's not a bad problem to have. You say, okay, we have to spend this much money in order to keep this benefit. And so to keep that tax-exempt status, well, then, yeah, we need to make sure that we're hitting that level at least meeting or exceeding that level each year. Finally, sovereign wealth funds on this slide. Minimum investment requirements, socially or ethically acceptable assets. This is going to be on a country by country basis, right? If this is a, a wealth fund, you know, for a particular country, a sovereign wealth fund, as we call that, then obviously it's going to be up to the citizenry and up to the politicians of that citizenry to make those decisions as far as what does this fund want to invest in? What do we feel is ethically or socially responsible? So there may be some limits on the amount of investment involved, the type of investments involved. It may also be some limits and the type of currencies that they want to put their investments into. All right, next thing, tax considerations. Okay, taxable investors should base asset allocation on after-tax risk 
and return. And so certainly that's going to play a role in the type of strategy that you pursue. The higher the tax rate, well, there's greater benefit in tax-exempt securities, first of all. And also that is going to lend a little bit more credence to a passive type of investment policy, simply because the more you trade, particularly if you're selling assets that have a capital gain, you're realizing that capital gain sooner. And so it's going to be less tax efficient. So we need to keep this in mind. So some considerations, like I said, capital gains, they're taxed at lower rates. They can be deferred if you hang on to the security, buy and hold. Tax advantage locations may exist. So TDAs, tax deferred accounts, TEA, tax exempt accounts. So if you have those accounts or access to those securities, um, dividends are taxed at lower rates as well. So for corporations, for example, in the United States, if they own preferred stock, um, you know, longstanding, they've got a, a 70% tax exemption on the dividends on preferred stock. That's something that's gone back a long way. Now, tax considerations, well, we know what our after-tax return is, right? It's our pre-tax return, our PT, multiplied by 1 minus T. So what does that do for our standard deviation? If I take the standard deviation on an after-tax basis, well, that's my standard deviation on a pre-tax basis also multiplied by 1 minus t. Notice, however, that doesn't change the correlation at all. Your after-tax correlation is going to be the same as your pre-tax correlation. So when we're thinking about diversifying our portfolio in the presence of taxes, well, the correlation doesn't change. Okay, so effective tax rates differ by asset class. So obviously, the higher the effective tax rate is per asset class, well, then certainly that's going to have a greater impact on your after-tax result. Tax effects are not consistent by asset classes. So again, that's something we need to keep in mind. Simply the timing of the cash flows. If I have a growth stock that pays no dividends and I only has capital gains and I have a buy and hold uh, stance in my asset allocation, well, then I'm postponing those taxes, deferring those taxes as long as possible out into the future. On the other hand, if I own a bond that's throwing cash flows to me every month or every quarter or every six months, well, then obviously that's going to be current income and I'm going to have a tax impact on those every, every period, every tax year as a result. So those tax effects are not consistent across asset classes. So after tax efficient frontier and asset allocations, that may differ between the types of investor you have and the type of assets that you're looking at. So as I mentioned earlier, correlations are a market level issue. They're not investor specific. Therefore, they're unaffected by the investor's tax situation. OK, some other things that complicate the picture, unrealized capital gains and losses. So we may have a capital gains overhang in our portfolio currently. We have some capital gains from prior periods. We haven't paid taxes on those capital gains yet, so we have an overhang. We have this deferred tax liability that's just sort of hanging over our heads. And so the question is, if we can avoid it, if we can keep pushing it out into the future, well, that makes the portfolio more tax efficient. So if the cost basis for tax purposes of an investment is different than the current market value, we have an existing unrealized capital gain or capital loss if we're looking at that in the other direction. So that gives us a tax liability or tax asset, again, depending upon which perspective we're looking at that from. So market value greater than cost basis, unrealized gain, that is an unrealized tax liability. That's what I mean by that capital gains tax overhang. Market value is less than cost basis. Well, now we have an unrealized loss that we may be able to use to sort of counteract gains. That's a tax asset. We can think of it in those terms. Now, generally speaking, if markets are going up over time, we're going to have typically more unrealized gains than unrealized losses. But certainly, we can go through periods of time in the market where the reverse may be true. So how do we adjust for this? Well, let's say we assume that the asset will be sold today. So we're going to subtract out the value of the embedded capital gains tax from the current market value. Or we can also say, let's assume that we're going to sell it on some future date. And then whenever we sort of assume what that is, it's going to be a little bit arbitrary because we're forecasting here. We can take that tax liability and discount it back to the present value, either using the assets after tax return or the after tax risk free rate. So we can do that one of two ways to try and get a sense of how we need to adjust for these unrealized capital gains and losses. All right. So what does that mean in terms of rebalancing? Well, if I have a capital gains overhang, right? I have these capital gains that I've not realized yet and I've not paid taxes on. It does mean that if I start rebalancing my portfolio as I should, well, that's going to cause me to realize some of those gains. So that's actually a friction that may keep me from wanting to rebalance my portfolio. So what I can try and do is sort of adjust my rebalancing range. So let's say just to take a basic example, We've got a balanced portfolio, 50% stocks, 50% bonds, all right? 
the gains in stocks have sort of moved those weights to where now the portfolio is 55-45, let's say. Well, rebalancing would say I need to sell 5% of the portfolio value in stocks, add to that, put that in the bond side so that I'm back to 50-50. But if I'm going to realize some capital gains in doing so, well, then maybe I don't necessarily do it to that full degree. All right. So what I can do is I can reduce the frequency that I rebalance. And I can also think about this from a measure of what range do I decide to rebalance. So I can increase the allowed deviation. That's that DEV that we're defining there from the target allocation weight. All right. So the after-tax deviation, let's say that's the pre-tax deviation. We divide that by one minus T. So let's say from our 50-50 portfolio, we say, okay, we're going to rebalance whenever it gets, you know, between or greater than or less than 45, greater than 55. All right. Well, let's say we're at that point. Okay. If there's taxes involved and unrealized capital gains that we're going to pay taxes on, well, then maybe we extend that window a little bit to accommodate for that. So if I thought the deviation was 5% in either direction and my tax rate is 40%, then I would take that 5% divide by 1 minus 0.4, and that would give me the new range of deviation that I would allow to accommodate the fact that I'm going to have to pay taxes if I do that rebalancing. So the allowed range is going to get a little bit wider. It's going to get a little bit wider because I allow for that increase in the range as a result of the fact that I've got that tax impact hanging over my head. Okay, so some other complications, tax location. So if I have assets that are subject to lowest effective tax rates, then what do I want to put those? The ones that have the lowest tax rates, I want to put those in taxable accounts. On the other hand, if I have assets that are going to be subject to higher or highest effective tax rates, well, then those are the ones I'm going to want to stash in those tax deferred and tax exempt accounts. So I want to be strategic in the types of, account of accounts that I have at my disposal in terms of what types of assets I want to own in them. So from an individual's perspective, if we have a taxable brokerage account versus an individual retirement account, well, assets are going to be subject to higher effective tax rates. So, you know, let's say if I want to have bonds in my portfolio and the income from those bonds is going to be treated as current income, and let's say I'm in the top tax bracket, well, then my bond investments actually are going to work a little bit better if I put those into my IRA versus my taxable brokerage account, right? Because I'm going to be able to at least defer those tax costs out into the future um, as opposed to paying them every year, which is what's going to happen if I do it in a taxable account, right? So, you know, we have to put an asterisk on that, you know, because governments rarely allow unlimited investing in tax advantage accounts, right? We have limits in our IRAs, limits in our 401ks, 403bs. So we take advantage of this while we can or where we can, but understanding that, yeah, at some point we're going to hit a ceiling. Okay. Next thing, tax locations multiply the choices. What do we mean by that? So optimizing for taxes, well, it should consider both the available classes of investments and the locations in terms of types of accounts. So if I have two different asset classes, equity and bonds, let's say, equity and fixed income, and I have two locations for allocation choices. So this is getting back to what I was saying a moment ago. So equity, particularly if it's stock that doesn't pay dividends, put that in the taxable account because no dividends. First of all, you're not going to realize um, income cash flows from the dividends. And if you're a buy and hold investor, that capital gain gets deferred out into the future. So that's a great asset to put in your taxable account. You could put equity in a tax deferred account. When is that going to be sort of the better choice? Well, probably a better choice, frankly, if you have uh, stocks that pay very high dividends. Right? So if we have preferred stocks or uh, stocks of uh, consumer non-durables, utility companies, banks that pay high dividends, well, instead of having to pay taxes on that dividend each year, if it makes sense to put it, that investment into your 401k or your IRA, well, then, yeah, you can at least uh, shelter and defer some of, the, some of that tax bill out into the future. Fixed income in a taxable account, well, those are going to be um, perhaps bonds that don't pay very high uh, coupon rates, right? Those are going to be ones where you would have less current income. So putting those in a taxable account may make sense in that case. Fixed income in a tax deferred account, well, those are going to be ones that pay higher coupon rates. Going back to number three, one thing I forgot to mention, if you own municipal bonds in the United States, for example, municipal bonds um, are exempt from federal taxes, well, then you definitely want to put those in a taxable account because they're sheltered because of that other reason. You never want to put municipal bonds into a tax deferred or tax sheltered account because you're getting shelter from something that's not going to be there in the first place. You've already got that tax exemption.
Okay, final point as we're talking about taxes here, tax loss harvesting. What does that term mean? It means that if I'm selling some assets that have a capital gain that I'm realizing and I'm going to have to pay taxes on, well, maybe I can try and offset that by selling off some other assets that, may, that I may have a loss on, right? So I counteract those capital gains with some capital losses. It helps to minimize my tax burden, at least for that period. It can help me be a little bit more efficient in how I deal with taxes in the portfolio.